Hello, I'm Robert Stone, President and CEO of City of Hope, and I want to welcome you to our discussion of health equity. It's an issue that's of enormous importance today, and nowhere is it more important than in cancer, because cancer care is different. Cancer is not only a complex set of diseases that affect every organ in the body, but cancer is different for every patient. And cancer care is different because speed in getting the right diagnosis and the right treatment the first time are absolutely essential. It's the difference quite literally between life and death. Cancer care has evolved in a few short years with discoveries in advanced technologies that enable us to diagnose and treat cancer better than ever before. The next phase of the National Cancer Moonshot promises to bring even more advances and more opportunities for hope. Yet far too many of our neighbors in far too many communities, specifically communities of color, are being left behind. They are being denied the hope and care they deserve to be able to benefit from the same advances that are saving more and more lives every day. That's why our goal at City of Hope is to democratize access to care, to ensure that as many patients as possible have access to leading edge treatments and care, and that they have that access regardless of their circumstances or the zip code where they live. It's why we are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion in every part of City of Hope. It's also why we are staunch advocates for changes in regulations and public policy that support democratization of cancer care, including our support for the California Cancer Patients Bill of Rights. We have made progress, but there is still much work to do, as you'll hear from our speakers today. Hello, welcome to Hope Talks, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm Amanda Salas, your Hope Talks host. You may know me as a news anchor, a reporter, and every day on Good Day LA on Fox 11 here in Los Angeles, but I'm also a City of Hope patient and now a cancer survivor. It is an absolute privilege to serve as tonight's host. The subject of health equity is a personal one for me. I'm standing here today because City of Hope helped me beat non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But my road to get here was not a straight path. However, once I did get here, I found not only the expertise and the care I needed, I found the compassion, communication, and cultural sensitivity that made all the difference for me and my family during my cancer journey. I'm proud to start our program by sharing my story with you today. 2019 was going to be my year. I got a promotion at my job, but I just didn't feel right. I didn't feel good physically, and I knew something was off. And I went to doctor after doctor and was told it was different things like eczema, stress, a lack of sleep, until I found out that I was diagnosed with cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was blessed with good health for three decades of my life, and then all of a sudden, boom, you have cancer, boom, you have to start chemotherapy. That, that was like just the blow that was hard to, hard to take in the beginning. But then we just, we said, okay, this is what we have to do. We're gonna deal with it together. Lymphomas, lymphoma can be tricky because sometimes the symptoms are vague. I think those problems can be compounded if they have a primary care physician or whatever it is who, who you know, they don't connect with well, you know, whether it be culturally or linguistically, that magnifies the problem tremendously. I didn't find City of Hope, City of Hope found me. Uh, I was in a different hospital and my oncologist at the time, he was a lovely man, and he said to me, I think you would be in the best hands at City of Hope with Dr. Herrera. What I loved the most about Dr. Herrera is you didn't just inherit me as a patient. You didn't just get me. You got me, you got my mom, and you had my, at the time, 84-year-old grandmother in tow, too. So when I go to a checkup, they're coming with me. And Dr. Herrera was all about family. He understood us. He connected to us on a cultural level. And he was just really easy to talk to. The way he explained something to me, he made sure he was able to explain it to my mom and grandma as well. I think for many cultures, particularly in, in our, you know, kind of Hispanic community, 
uh, family plays a huge role. I always take great care to make sure uh, that family members are engaged, that they're understanding. To be honest with you, a lot of the times when a patient's going through cancer treatment or diagnosis, it's hard to absorb everything. You know, it's so overwhelming. But family members can play a critical role in, in helping to kind of catch all that information. My family's so important to me. Like I get, em I actually get really emotional talking about them because I do, because who else can say they have their mom and grandma by their, by their side their whole time during treatment. I always tell people if you're gonna have to face a cancer diagnosis, there's no better place to be than City of Hope. And Cassie in the Positive Image Center, she came to my room, she braided my hair, and that's when I started shedding my hair for the first time. And I started grasping the idea of, wow, I'm gonna lose my hair. And she was there to say, no worries, I've got you, come down here, I'll help you with scarves, wigs, haircuts. And do you know what the City of Hope staff did for me? I was going through chemo, I was missing the Emmys. They put on scrubs and they drew like a tuxedo bow tie and then they had their flashes on their phones to make it look like they were paparazzi for me. We were all having an Emmy watch party and it made it a little less sad, a little less hard for me knowing that I was missing all the action. It was my home away from home. As a parent, I mean, you never expect your child to get sick, and just to see her journey of how she received her diagnosis and how she took the path to healing, I'm just so proud of her. I'm so glad that City of Hope found me. It all happened for a reason. I love City of Hope for being diverse and being connected and being aware, and I went from check-in to labs to going to the doctor you've seen such a sea of diverse faces from all ages all backgrounds gender everything representation matters as a hispanic physician i take it really you know as an as a as a real privilege to be able to serve patients in our community um, you know from underserved backgrounds who you know might not have always had access to excellent, you know, world-class care like we can provide at City of Hope. I felt in the best hands at City of Hope, and I felt part of a City of Hope club that I never knew I would have a membership to, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I wanna give a big shout out to Dr. Herrera, my Hispanic hematology hero, and to everyone here at City of Hope who helped me on the road to healing. Thank you so much. Earlier, you heard Robert Stone talk about the fact that not everyone is getting the treatment that they need for their cancer. Although we all might agree that your cancer outcomes shouldn't be determined by your race, your gender, your zip code, or socioeconomic status, these are real factors that can make it harder for patients to access the specialty cancer care that can save their life. Health disparities are a major issue in America, and tonight's program will explore why there is such urgency in addressing health equity. We can make a difference in patients' lives and make real progress against cancer. You'll hear from City of Hope's top scientists and experts on why health equity in everything from clinical trials and patient care to our healthcare workforce matters to all of us. Throughout the program, you'll actually have an opportunity to ask questions of our experts during three Q&A sessions. You can submit your questions in the chat. First, here's Dr. Kim Lynn Ashing, an early champion for health equities who has made it a, prior, a primary focus of her work to improve health outcomes for diverse populations. Health equity is in our DNA because our origin story is really about serving the underserved and the medically vulnerable in our communities. Cancer disparities are serious. Uh, we know that ethnic minority populations um, have poor treatment response in some cases, um, have earlier mortality and morbidity due to cancer. And we want to change all of that. When cancer impacts a community at a younger age, um, we have societal burdens. That's, that's not just for that person or family or community, but it really affects all of us. If we have lost a life too early, it means that that person cannot be a productive part of society. So when I think about the future 
I envision um, where any patient, regardless of their social standing, regardless of their insurance coverage, regardless of their neighborhood, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their religion, their gender, their sexual orientation, and gender identity, that they would have care that is honoring their humanity and, and care that is responsive to their cancer so they're getting the best scientific-based medicine, but they're getting the best quality care to advance their length of life, but also their quality of life and well-being. And City of Hope is the right place to lead in the science of health disparities and the practice of health equity. We need to do this now. We need to leverage our priorities and our resources to do this because this is the future of medicine. As Dr. Ashing says, the time to do this work is now. Did you know that cancer is the leading cause of death among Latinos? And about one in three Latino men and women will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetimes? Or that African Americans have had the highest overall cancer death rate for more than four decades? Although many types of cancer disproportionately affect racial and ethnic minorities, they are largely underrepresented in clinical trials. As a result, we are missing substantial amounts of data to inform how disease affects different populations, and particularly people of color. If we do not start building knowledge about cancer in diverse populations, that gap will just continue to widen and we'll be missing critical information that can help us drive innovation in treatments and therapies. So what can we do to narrow this gap? And do we really understand cancer if we don't understand it in all populations? Dr. Loretta Irunse, thoracic surgeon and assistant professor in the Department of Health Equities, and Dr. Stephen Gruber, director of the Center for Precision Medicine, discuss the impact of health inequities in cancer and why diversity matters. Precision medicine is a way to describe how we use genetic and genomic information to inform patient care. And really, in many respects, it's just using the information that's uniquely contained within each tumor, and in fact, in all the cells of our body, to be able to better understand how to harness that information to direct the right drug to the right patient at the right time. You know, precision medicine has made a huge impact on the field of lung cancer. Um, when I started training many years ago, um, the truth is patients who had more advanced disease, especially stage four, there were very few options that we could give them. And now we have many patients who are living for several years um, because we have a better understanding, as you've mentioned, around the genomics of their tumor. And now we have precise and more targeted therapies that allow us to, to be more precise in our treatment of patients. We need to be really attentive to those differences that can help us take better care of patients and populations. Specifically, what we found with respect to women with breast cancer is that by understanding a particular genetic signature, one that relates to inherited susceptibility to cancer, it has more than just implications for how did that cancer arise within someone and how can we prevent it in family members. It also has a huge impact on how we now treat those patients with breast cancer. And specifically, if there were ways in which we could improve access, especially for our African-American breast cancer patients, it could make a huge difference mm -hmm. in outcomes. And that is the reason why it's so important that we get these opportunities to every patient, right? And, and that's one of the goals at City of Hope, is that we are able to get to every demographic, every community, um, because right now that isn't the case, and that has to change. And, and I'm excited that we are trying to lead the efforts here at this institution.
right now, because most of the early studies were done in populations that were overrepresented uh, by white populations, we just didn't have enough information to be able to understand and interpret the diversity of our genome within the context of ancestry and history. Now that we're devoting more energy to do that, I think it's really important for us to recognize that we have to bring to bear all that information so that's equally relevant for all of the patients that we serve. When we think, of, we, we think about genetics, we think about genomics, but we also need to be thinking about social determinants. We need to be thinking about environment, and we need to understand that we are taking care of patients, and these patients are whole, and these patients live in a social context. Right, And so um, we've done some work that have shown that social determinants do impact the somatic mutations. They do impact what tumors look like. And so in order to be more precise in medicine through precision medicine, we're going to need to understand the environment and the social context. We're going to need to understand um, the structural inequities that patients are experiencing. I certainly agree that now is the time to invest in the future, and um, I think one reason is because there are, there are considerable populations that are still being left behind. If we aren't um, focusing on investing in better understanding how disparate groups are uh, have disparate outcomes, then we will continue to see these disparities and continue to sort of sit where um, health uh, inequity prevails. I think City of Pope is the right place for this work to be happening because we have experts and energy around genomics and genetics and biology and precision medicine. And we also have expertise and uh, passion around health equity. Um, I think, you know, when you are able to bring and integrate those two very important sciences um, and aspects of medicine together, um, you are able to make a huge difference. I think City of Hope is really at the frontier of precision medicine precisely because we are working together. It will help all of us take better care of patients. I, I love the way that as an organization we've just made the commitment to recognize the complexity of the issues, but the deep necessity to invest the resources that will help us get uh, to better outcomes for cancer patients. So that we can not only take care of the patient sitting in front of us, but so that we can make a concerted effort to diminish the burden of cancer in the community. I'm joined now by Dr. Gruber, who's ready to take some questions from our audience. Dr. Gruber, it is so great to have you with us today. Thanks, Amanda, great to be here. So let's get to our first question from the audience. Again, please use the chat to submit your questions and we'll start with a few that we've already received. First question, Dr. Gruber, City of Hope is expanding in Southern California and recently acquired Cancer Treatment Centers of America. So how does this expanded footprint impact City of Hope's efforts related to health equity and precision medicine? City of Hope's work with Cancer Treatment Centers of America is a big deal. What we are going to be able to do together with Cancer Treatment Centers of America is really together think about how to improve the delivery of new models of cancer care at a national level, and specifically by addressing the issues that are so important to health equity and diversity. Think for a moment about the fact that City of Hope is one of the most prominent NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers in the United States with a rich portfolio of clinical trials that advances care at the highest levels. And to be able to deliver that at a national model with one of the most trusted care providers at a national level with CTCA, I think is really a transformational opportunity. I agree. How is City of Hope's approach to precision medicine different from other places? Precision medicine is a term that's used by lots of different groups to underline the possibility of using genomic information, usually from a patient's tumor, to guide the best 
treatment and care for each individual person. But the City of Hope's approach is much more expansive than that. We actually care for the entire person by looking not just at the DNA from a tumor, but the DNA that is inherited from our parents in a way that gives us a much fuller and more expansive picture of things that might be contributing, not only to how cancers behave, but to what caused cancers. Yeah. That gives us a very unique opportunity to expand that information, not just to treat patients, but also to use that information to prevent cancer in relatives. And we're committed to being able to provide universal access to precision medicine to our patients. It's a really exciting time for us. I mean, it is. It's customizing cancer care for the individual and their families. Um, another question from our chat, Dr. Gruber. Can you give any insight on recent research that's related to endometrial or uterine cancers or prostate cancer? Endometrial cancer, or cancer of the lining of the uterus, is the fourth most common cancer in women in the United States. And we've known a lot about the things that can contribute to the risk of endometrial cancer uh, for many years. Um, it's a cancer that has been hormonally balanced uh, in the way in which the lining of the uterus interacts. But one of the things that is so intriguing about the application of precision medicine to endometrial cancer is the way in which we now recognize that many endometrial cancers benefit from new therapies which were just recently approved by the FDA. This allows us to use information that is sometimes accompanied with a family history, but oftentimes just a unique molecular fingerprint that designates some endometrial cancers as being particularly responsive to these new therapies. Thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Gruber, two words that both you and I are familiar with, side effects. So what kind of research is happening around side effects at City of Hope? We are quite fortunate that we have a supportive care department that is especially attentive to side effects. Not only do our physicians and nurse practitioners and staff uh, pay close attention to the side effects that can arise uh, with treatments for cancer, uh, but by recognizing that is really an important field of study, we can make even more impact. One of the things that we recognize is that side effects by themselves do not necessarily correspond to the efficacy or how well a treatment works. Uh, but by studying how patients describe their side effects and, and what we can do to minimize them is one of the things that really distinguishes our cancer care. Yes, very appreciated. Another question for you, what is City of Hope doing to increase the Latino participation within the clinical trials research that are most needed? Well, it's a very important issue for us to address for a number of reasons. First of all, here in Southern California, we cherish the rich diversity of the community that we serve. And one of the ways that we are really directly addressing that is by making sure that our faculty and our staff match the groups that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, we are really dedicated to making sure that we are uh, bringing on the very best oncologists in the United States uh, with diverse backgrounds themselves in order to address many of those important needs. But in addition, there are community outreach programs that our population sciences group is reaching out to make sure that we're not just identifying people with cancer, but people who are at risk of cancer so that we can help better reduce the burden of cancer uh, in the communities that we serve. Thank you. And our last question, Dr. Gruber, this is urgent. The National Bone Marrow Registry needs more diverse donors. Can you talk a little bit about this and how people can help? City of Hope is the nation's leading center for bone marrow transplantation. And for those that don't know what a bone marrow transplant involves, especially for patients who have leukemia, in order to treat that effectively, it requires both a combination of chemotherapy to reduce the amount of leukemia that a patient has, but when we can get patients into remission, we can lead to cures 
by replacing somebody's bone marrow with the bone marrow of another person, but it has to be a perfect match. And to find a perfect match is not always possible from a family member. In fact, only 30% of individuals who need a bone marrow transplant can find a donor who's a perfect match from within their own family. So therefore, we go to the National Bone Marrow Transplant uh, registry to identify what we call matched unrelated donors. Mm. And here's the challenge. If you are a leukemia patient of white European ancestry, the chance that you will find a perfect match within our bone marrow transplant national registry is about 77%. If you are African American, the chance that you will find a perfect match unrelated donor within the transplant registry is only 23%. Mm. And that disparity is one that we can address in a number of different ways, but it really creates an opportunity for us to recognize that the diversity that we serve can be better enriched by making sure that we are inviting people of all backgrounds uh, to consider becoming a bone marrow donor, um, which can be as simple as donating blood in a very special way that allows those um, stem cells to be harvested for bone marrow. So important. Thank you so much. Well, we are out of time for this part of our program, but we will take the rest of your questions and respond to as many as possible online. Thank you so much, Dr. Gruber. Thanks, Amanda. The good news is that we live in a time when the promise of science and precision medicine is allowing us to make giant leaps forward in our understanding of cancer. But for patients from diverse communities to benefit, we have to be able to reach them, build trust to eliminate the barriers that prevent so many people from getting the care they need. We invited Myra Serrano from City of Hope's Community Alliance for Research and Education and Bethany Davis, a postdoctoral research associate at City of Hope's Translational Genomics Research Institute, who works with indigenous communities to talk about overcoming barriers to care and building trust in diverse communities. So I'd like to think of ourselves as the liaisons between City of Hope and the community, right? We're the, we're the bridge that is built between the two. And so what we do is we offer different community programs, including free screenings, free health education programs, free capacity building for our community partners, and we also do a lot of health disparities research. Mm -hmm. But all of the work that we do is based on community need and with community input. Well, one specific uh, tribal community within Arizona they approached TGen and were like, hey, we're seeing this large amount of kidney cancer cases, you know, can we get your input? So it was actually the community reaching out. And so I really think that was a step forward in terms of developing a trust. The whole point of research is, you know, for the community to use it, right? We have the saying from bench to bedside to community because it doesn't, does us no good if it stays in the bench, if it stays at the bedside. Mm -hmm. And so the best way to know what research is gonna get to that point is to hear from the people it's going to impact is to have the people who it's going to impact be involved in the process. One of the benefits of being from the Latino community, being from the Los Angeles community, is that I have, um, I'm able to open doors that other people wouldn't because I am able to relate to the community, whether I speak their language, I come from a similar background, um, even if it's something as small as a cultural nuance. When I was looking for jobs in terms of my postdoctoral fellowship. I came across what TGen was doing with some of the other tribes in Arizona. And I got really excited because it's not just them and their motivation. It's actually what the community wanted. Like I said, they reached out to TGen and they said, hey, you know, we're seeing this rising case of kidney cancer in our community. We really don't know why. Yes, there could be genetic mutations that can contribute or increase your risk for cancer, but other times it's just because of their environment. And so one of the biggest things for tribal communities is that they live off their environment. They still have the plants, their herbs, a lot of them have their own crops. Uh, and so the fertilizers, fertilizers that are in the ground actually can contribute to their cancer and not many people know that unless you study heavy metal toxicity. And so that, went, that just kind of really tied in in terms of 
what really attracted me to teach and was it wasn't just, oh, let's focus on mutation X. No, let's actually understand the bigger picture. Let's understand what the community is exposed to that is driving their cancer. And so that is actually remarkable. So one of the things that we've used is uh, worked with community leaders. So in the Latino community, we use the promotoras, which are community health workers. And these are lay people in the community who uh, have gone through training, um, you know, different topics for us. Our promotoras learn about cancer, cancer screening. We have promotoras who do clinical trials and so that they navigate people through the whole process. Because this is the mom at the PTA meeting with you. This is the mom who, you know, goes to the same grocery store you do. And if she's telling you, hey, clinical trials, this is what I know about this trial it's really safe, it's really going to be helpful for us and for our kids, um, it really makes a difference um, because it's really coming from somebody. So we do that with churches, you know, you know, whether it's pastors or priests or, you know, the first ladies of the church, working with these community leaders for us has really opened a lot of doors in reaching some of these communities. And a lot of the programs, the research programs that are being established with the various tribal communities within Arizona, we're making sure that we include some of those leaders, whether it's the tribal chairman or community liaison, and just getting them involved. I have never seen this level of respect before until I came to TGen. And that, that's one thing I really admired about TGen and my mentor is that level of respect that he has for the community. Because, you know, developing that trust, it definitely takes time, but it, it, and it's for good reason. We actually, um, in, like you were saying, involve the leaders in the study. We actually work with leaders and start from scratch. Like we help them apply for grants for their own studies and that where maybe we're a partner and we bring in our science or our evaluation or our data capacity and help them there because then that leads to sustainability. I don't want some research project or some study to come to a community and the minute City of Hope leaves, it ends. We want it to stay in that community and so we work on um, building community sustainability and making sure that they're trained and capable of doing this and then providing that technical support. If they understand from start to finish and even after the project's finished, they'll be, that trust will still be there and they'll be more welcoming for other future studies. Exactly. And I'm so glad City Hope and TGen are doing that, right? They, they built that trust in the community, they're able to do this research, and then they're able to bring it back. We talk about the importance of participating in that aspect, about if we don't participate, if people who look like me, people from my community, women and people of color don't participate, then those things will not be made for us. So it needs to be by us, for us, right? And so that's why it's so important to participate. I focus on the collectivistic culture of the Latino community. I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing it for our community, um, you know, para nuestra comunidad, which means for our community. And so that's why we're doing the research because you might not get the immediate benefit, but that doesn't really matter in Latino communities as much. That's not how you sell, you know, participation in a clinical trial, but you said this is to benefit your children, your children's children in your community as a whole and that really has an impact. Do you see some of the similarities in the indigenous community as well? One of the other things that I really appreciated when we started um, recruiting uh, some of the tribal community members in the various cancer studies was that they one of the biggest things that they, they wanted we had to bring in a medicine healer to bless the area and it's different for each tribal communities so depending on wh what descendant you are of, if a piece of you is not, you're not whole as a body, you're not gonna go into the next world. And so by blessing your sample, that allows you passing to the next world if you were to succumb to your disorder or disease. It's so respectful too, of the whole process. And so I think it's, it's really wonderful that they would do that to be respectful of the community. There's so much overlap between the Latino communities and tribal communities, it's just mind blowing. That's why I think it's so important to speak to other researchers, to have this communication, but it's so important to have that connection and that collaboration because the only people who are gonna benefit from that is our community. 
And I'm joined now live by Myra and Bethany to take your questions. Myra, Bethany, welcome, and thanks for that enlightening conversation on the work you both do in your communities. Okay, so let's open it up to our audience and take our first question. Bethany, this one's for you. What is one thing about cancer that you wish more people in the community understood? Uh, that precision medicine is not so precise. For example, when we look at the Cancer Genome Atlas, they have sequenced well over 20,000 cancer patient samples to improve cancer therapeutics. However, of, that, of those 20,000 individuals that were sequenced, only 0.5% are of Native American background. So it's gonna be very important that we include Native Americans in cancer genome initiatives and in clinical trials. So that way we can also improve the cancer outcomes for these groups as well. Absolutely, so one size does not fit all when it comes to treatment. Myra, this question's for you. Recognizing that it is not up to those who are marginalized to fix the challenges they face, how can patients and health professionals who are members of underrepresented groups help address some of the issues that you talk about? You know, that's absolutely correct, Amanda. The onus shouldn't fall on the marginalized communities. But as healthcare professionals, we have the responsibility to ensure that they have a seat at the table to make sure that they're, we can amplify their voices because they need to be there as part of the decision-making process since it's about their communities and they're the ones with the lived experience. And so the saying goes that nothing about us without us. And City of Hope actually practices that. We make sure that our community partners and our voices are part of that decision-making process, part of that steady development process, so that we know that these outcomes are gonna impact the communities it's supposed to impact. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question for you, Myra. Language barriers, it's a big issue in healthcare when it comes to the Latino community. So what is City of Hope doing to better communicate all the amazing work that you're doing to this population? So we make sure that our staff is representative of the community that we serve. So our staff looks like our community and also speaks the languages that our community does. If it doesn't, we have a great interpreter services program that can provide interpretive services in order to overcome those language barriers. But we go above and beyond that. In addition to, we create health education materials that are in language and you know are representative of that community. And we make those health education materials with the community that it's intended for. So it's this this co-design process and this user-centered design process so that we know it'll be effective and it's gonna reach the population it's supposed to reach. And speaking of reaching the population, um, Bethany, you touched on this a bit. One of our audience members says that not enough known in the communities about what clinical trials are available. So how do we get the word out, ladies? Um, so the first thing is just, you know, go to the communities, the, pop, the communities and just let them know that we are there. This is what is available. We don't want to make sure, we don't want to push it upon them. We, didn't, we need to make sure it's what the community needs and what the community wants for them to be advocates. Um, and not only that, but to be involved in clinical trials. Myra, how do we get the word out? Well, I'll add to that. So City of Hope has wonderful community research navigator programs where we take champions in the community who are trusted sources to spread the awareness and information about the importance of clinical trials and the importance of representation of underrepresented groups in clinical trials. And we closely work with these community health workers, promotoras, faith-based leaders, and we train them on clinical trials in the entire process. And then they go out and bring that awareness into the community. And then additionally, we also train our staff internally on how to engage communities of color as well so that they practice cultural humility and that you know it makes the study also more um, responsive to the needs of our community. All said. Uh, last question, Bethany, addressing health equity is clearly a challenging and complex issue. What keeps you going every day? What gives you the most hope? The opportunity to bring change especially when it comes to cancer research. Uh, there's not many of my background in my research, being a fellow Native American. Um, not many have you know, went on to get degrees, especially those in research. So mm -hmm. being able to want to make a change and find a, finding opportunities to do that, that is what keeps me um, motivated. I love that. And Myra, what gives you the most hope? 
I think the most hope is, I have a cancer history in my family and I know what it's like firsthand uh, witnessing it and making sure that nobody else has to go through that trouble, nobody else has to overcome the barriers my family has had to overcome, including language and access to care, um, is really what drives and motivates me. And just like Bethany said, um, not seeing too many people who look like me, being Latina and not seeing too many researchers at that level who look like me, um, I really like I'm passionate about providing, um, being a role model for younger Latinos so that they know it's possible because when you can see it, you can be it. I love that. Representation truly does matter and family is everything. Thank you so much, Myra and Bethany, for joining us today. Thank you, Amanda. I was fortunate to have a doctor who shared a similar ethnic and cultural background as me. But did you know that black physicians represent just 5% of active US physicians and Hispanic physicians just under 6%? A lack of diversity among physicians in the workforce adds to the disparities in treatment, often creating mistrust and poor communication between patients and care providers. Increasing diversity and improving cultural awareness and sensitivity among all clinicians are key to establishing that trust and bringing more patients into care. There are many leaders at City of Hope who bring interesting perspectives to the workforce diversity imperative. First up, we'll hear from Dr. Rick Kittles, who leads the Division of Health Equities at City of Hope, as well as some of his extraordinary colleagues who are working to increase diversity in the biomedical workforce. We'll follow that with a conversation and Q&A with my friend, Angela Talton, City of Hope's Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer. Here is Dr. Kittles and his team. For some communities, they don't necessarily see themselves at some of these institutions. They don't have advocates in their own community saying this is important. The reason that is is because there's not a lot of underrepresented minorities in biomedical research. And so what we're working on now is developing a pipeline to increase diversity in the biomedical workforce. What we do is we focus on genetic and biological determinants of prostate cancer health disparities. Since we're here at City of Hope, we're starting to expand our horizon to see how we can collaborate on looking at other genetic determinants or other potential drug targets that may be specific in people of color. We're looking at not just genetics, but we're also looking at behavioral differences such as vitamin D supplementation and how vitamin D has anti-cancer benefits. People that I work with, their skills are not just gonna be honed in the laboratory, but also out in the community. It makes you a much more well-rounded scientist when you're able to answer questions at the bench, but then also get folks in the community excited about what you're doing to the point where they want to be involved. The City of Hope is interested in what is best for their employees as well as what's best for patients. You can see the diversity increasing. You see it in terms of who's employed here, who our patients are looking like. That's what having a very diverse institution brings. Individuals who come together trying to answer some very important questions in different ways ultimately is going to lead to a lot of success. Angela, I am so happy to be sitting down with you and having a conversation about health equity. It's not only been on my mind, but in my heart. And this is just really exciting to get to know more about this issue with you. Well, Amanda, it is so wonderful to be here with you with one of our patients from City of Hope. So thank you so much. So I'm really very excited to learn more about it, knowing that it's a scientific imperative to address health equity. And also we've got to do the work to help underrepresented communities when it comes to healthcare. I know City of Hope is doing this every day and your role is very important. Tell me about your mission for health equity. You know, it is incredibly important to make this bridge between the City of Hope mission and our overarching focus around diversity, equity, and inclusion, to have that level of engagement with our patients from both the staff, mm -hmm. right, the entire care team, but also everyone here at City of Hope who supports that. It's important at City of Hope that we build trust, that we share, that we have a genomic focus 
at the DNA level around these underrepresented communities. And we're sharing that information. We're sharing that research. We are going out to the communities to uh, provide preventative care, to provide more education around screening. That's what is needed to build that bridge, to take down these barriers around health inequities mm -hmm. and to just share what we know and um, make sure that the communities learn to trust us. Very important. And like you said, trust is the core of it, and it starts from the top down. And diversity plays a huge role, not only amongst patients, but the care team as well. So I want to ask you, do you think it's not only important, but essential to hire health professionals of color? It is so important. Um, a recent study, I think it was USA Today, showed that 40% of patients of color are more apt to follow the treatment that they are given, the, mm -hmm. the treatment plan, when it's shared by a doctor of that same community. Wow, 40%. 40%. So, so you think about representing the communities that we want to make sure that when our patients come in, their caregivers, their family, they're seeing that representation. Yeah. Um, I, I recently heard that 21%, I think it's the number, that medical school enrollment by African American and Hispanic Latinx students is up 21%. Now driven by COVID, right? Yeah. And seeing the disparity within their communities, but yeah. it, the, at the end of the day, that's wonderful news. Yes. And we're wanting to see those students, you know, come to City of Hope. And, mm -hmm. and we have several initiatives um, outline in order to attract them to our organization. That's the key right there. It's not just lip service. You're opening up the doors for those who want to, to walk in from internships to programs, getting the word out. Our conversation that we're having today, I can speak as a patient. My doctor was Latino and we had that special connection. He also was able to communicate a lot of things to me on a cultural level that I will always cherish. The work around diversity, equity, and inclusion is really about that connection on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. Sharing the fact that, um, and particularly with communities of color, mm -hmm. that family unit is really important. Sometimes our uh, physicians may explain a diagnosis to the patient but then they have to also explain it to abuela. They might also <laughs> yes. have to explain it to brothers and sisters, yeah. you name it. And so we want to make sure that our care teams here at City of Hope understand that and understand we're not questioning expertise. It's just that family mm -hmm. is part of the decision that's oh. being made for that oh, patient yeah. and they're incredibly important. That level of cultural sensitivity is the type of training that we're going through here at City of Hope that is part of our um, training regimen every single year. What I'm gathering from what you're saying, Angela, is that we can't fix and even address these issues, these disparities within healthcare, unless we do hire more healthcare professionals of the diverse backgrounds of the patients that they're treating. When these students, when other physicians, when other care teams have more information about City of Hope, think about the discovery and the innovation that happens right here. So much. At our enterprise. Right. To have the opportunity to engage in clinical trials that are going to ultimately right help their community. Yes. It's an opportunity for these researchers and scientists to come in and have a lab and have the faculty that will help them with those new discoveries, those new discoveries that, you know, you just walk across campus and those are being delivered to patients real time here at City of Hope. Angela, are you optimistic that City of Hope can help not only address but improve the shortage of healthcare professionals of color? The more students that we can get engaged in STEM, we start to build that pipeline. So I talked a little bit earlier about the medical school enrollment yes. being up 21% yes. for African-American and Hispanic Latinx students. 
We need to go back further than that, though. And I am happy that here at City of Hope, we have programs that engage students sixth through the ninth grade with our Yes to Success program. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Rick Kittles, Dr. David Ahn, Dr. Christopher Sistrunk focus in on bringing students uh, to City of Hope, yes. virtually even, sharing with them the opportunities. What roles could you find a career in as it relates to STEM education. And um, they have been doing that for, for years here at City of Hope. The more we can do that, the more students see people who look like themselves right. in these roles, mm -hmm. the better options um, that they see that are afforded to them. And that's the core of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and certainly here at City of Hope. Angela is joining us live now to take your questions. I just have to say, Angela, I really enjoyed our conversation. I did and too. I know we're like new besties. Yes. And we really appreciate having you to field some questions from our audience. So we'll start with this one. How does the City of Hope's employee diversity compare to other organizations? Are there areas where you have seen meaningful change or maybe where you would like to see more change? You know, that's a really important question. Thank you for that. At City of Hope, we try to benchmark our performance with best in class. So we leverage Diversity Inc. It's an organization that measures diversity across multiple components, uh, human capital, leadership accountability, workplace diversity, policies, you name it. And they produce a top 50 list across multiple industries. Now we haven't made the top 50 list, but we are number eight among hospitals and healthcare systems. We're not resting on our laurels, though. Um, like most organizations, we seek to increase the representation of Black African Americans and Hispanic Latinx um, physicians and researchers. And we have produced an amazing program to do just that. We call it our Interdisciplinary Cluster Hire Program. We're seeking to hire six tenure track faculty, uh, clinicians and researchers who will join City of Hope under a dual appointment. So maybe that primary appointment is hematology. That um, secondary appointment will be in our population science division of health equity. And during that time, it's an incredible opportunity to engage with the community, to help with um, prevention, early detection, to um, provide outreach and mentorship to our postdocs or our grad students. Um, we're also hiring this as a cohort cohort model, thereby we've seen research that says it enhances socialization, it improves retention, and it removes that sort of feeling of isolation. So we're really looking forward to programs like this, something that was developed with our employees and our health equity work stream of our governance council and um, just other programs to enhance our diversity. You know, Angela, there was a recent New York Times article that indicated that women are also more likely to have their symptoms dismissed by medical providers. How does City of Hope mitigate this issue? Yeah, that, um, that medical gaslighting, it's, it's alarming and so sad to see mm -hmm. um, happening to so many women across the country. You know, you know, Amanda, I really appreciate you sharing your story. At the end of the day at City of Hope, we are seeking to provide compassionate care, but to the entire population of our patients. Uh, we're actually looking to increase and democratize cancer care. You heard Robert Stone mention that. Mm -hmm. um, making cancer care available to anyone, regardless of your zip code, you should have access to the best medicines, to the most renowned scientists. That, that bench to bedside is so incredibly important with cancer care. And um, we actually have partnered with the California State Legislature. They passed a bill, a Cancer Patient Bill of Rights on uh, August 19th in uh, 2021. And this Bill of Rights is uh, necessary for eliminating some of the barriers, right? Some of the barriers that are out there that 
are not providing that level of cancer care that's necessary for early detection and the precision cancer treatment that Dr. Gruber spoke about. And as we know, early detection is key. It's key. I'd also like to know what sorts of grants or training pipelines does City of Hope provide for prospective students, researchers from underrepresented backgrounds? You know, we talked a little bit about it in our piece, how important it is to sort of reach back and instill in students that interest in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and medicine. And, and we also talked a little bit about how important it is for students to see that dream, to see the physicians, to see the research. And so our um, Yes to Success, one of our summer programs, it really provides opportunities for students grades six to 12 to engage in biomedical research, to be in the lab with some of our um, principal investigators to, to really see opportunities from a career pathing perspective and understand some of their, their uh, opportunities from a professional development perspective. So we're really looking forward to bringing more of those type opportunities uh, so that students will see themselves actually at City of Hope working as physicians and scientists one day. That makes me smile. They're our future. And yes. I can't wait to see them here. Thank you so much, Angela. It was so nice speaking with you again. Thank you. City of Hope is doing important work in improving health equity, and they have a vision for making cancer care equal for all, from greater access in communities to new cures and therapies tailored for diverse patients to creating opportunity for tomorrow's cancer care workforce. Kristen Bertel, City of Hope's Chief Philanthropy Officer, shares how philanthropic partnership helps deliver on these bold ideas. Thanks, Amanda. Tonight you've learned about the challenges and very real barriers that prevent so many cancer patients from being able to access specialty cancer care. Barriers that limit their ability to get screenings and treatments that can make a real difference in their outcomes. The science of cancer is evolving rapidly and we are at a pivotal moment in that evolution. We must make sure that these new innovations in care extend to all patients everywhere if we truly want to make a difference in progress against this disease. After all, hearing the words, you have cancer is hard enough. No one should have to worry that they won't get the best care possible because of where they live, what they can afford, or the color of their skin. Despite these challenges, there's reason for hope. You've heard from our experts tonight about how City of Hope is working to bring more people into care and ensure that the advances we make in the fight against cancer benefit everyone equally. Our work to achieve health equity is happening on all fronts, from research and clinical trials to treatment innovations and the patient care experience. And we are making real progress thanks to the tremendous support of our donors who provide critical funding to accelerate and expand this work. City of Hope was founded by donors and volunteers 100 years ago to provide hope to people left out of care we began with a bold vision and a dedication to health equity then, and that compassion drives us still today. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your unwavering support. Together, we will give everyone diagnosed with cancer an equal opportunity for hope. Thank you so much, Kristen, and thanks to all of you who support City of Hope. I want to extend my sincere personal gratitude from myself and from my family for making my successful cancer journey possible. I am standing here right now, thanks to City of Hope. Two and a half years in remission. <laughs> the generosity of people like you who make it possible for so many other patients so that they can say the same. A big thank you to all of our special guests for breaking down some of the big issues in health equity and specialty cancer care, and for sharing all that City of Hope is doing to create a future where everyone has access to the cancer care they deserve. And of course, a special thanks to all of you for joining us today and helping spread awareness and being part of City of Hope's community of patients, staff, and families. Enjoy the rest of your evening.